Hello and welcome to Flip Academy. Today we're going to be looking at the series section of Paper 1 for the CIE A-Level Maths. So if we have a look here, uh, the first thing you need to be able to do is use binomial expansion. And in this case it's going to be a plus b to the power of n, where n is a positive integer. So keep in mind, when we don't have positive integers and we have like different sets, then binomial expansion does change slightly. So this is just for very standard, normal brackets. So for example, if you had something like 3 plus x to the power of 20, right? Because expanding those brackets would take you uh, a few decades. So we have a special little way of doing it. And that special little way is using something called the NCR button on your calculator. So what we're going to do is I'm going to write out the formula for you. So we have, in general, a plus b to the power of n is equal to first a to the n, nice and easy. And then all you're going to do is have the NCR button following that. So you have n, c, and then position 1, and that's going to be b to the power of n. Um, so yeah, a to the n minus 1. Three. So all you're going to do here is as you go along, you're reducing the power of a by 1 and increasing the power of b by 1 as well. So then we're just going to keep going. So that's plus here, plus n, c, 2, a, again, subtract 1, so it's minus 2, and then b squared, and then we can just keep going, you can just keep doing it. So just remember which numbers you are increasing and which ones you are decreasing. Like that, and then b cubed. So keep in mind this isn't a bracket, so sometimes what you might see is that people make it like a doubly thick c, just to make it super clear that it is a c and not a bracket. So uh, the best way to do this is using your calculator. So if we get our calculator open, I will show you exactly how to do this. Okay, But in this case, what might be good is if we actually write down the fact that we've got a is 2 here and b is minus, and b is here as minus x. Okay, And then obviously n is 6. So what are we looking for? We're looking for x squared and x cubed. So the x squared term will be where b squared is here. So we're going to be looking at this section here and this section here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to write out x squared, put a little colon, and that's going to equal n, which is 6. The c button, again, we can make it like slightly thicker to make it super clear it's not a bracket. And that's going to be position 2. And then a in this case is actually 3, so we're going to, uh, sorry, it's 2. So put 2, n minus 2 would be 4, and then times b squared. So again, keep in mind b is actually the whole thing, so it's minus x or squared, okay? And then that's going to be plus, and then all we're going to do is look at the coefficient after we've done that. So if we got our calculator back once more, the NCR button sits right here. It's the divide sign. So we put shift divide. N always goes on the left and it never changes, so six, and then you put the two. Now here's the key thing, okay? You can't just write down extra numbers now. You have to put the time sign, okay? You can't even use a bracket, so just make sure you do that. Then we have 2 to the power of 4. I do like to put these in brackets. Um, but again, you don't. I mean, I always put everything in brackets just to make sure. And then, obviously, I'm not going to put the x in, but we're going to put minus 1 squared. That's 240. So that term, that whole third term, is going to be 240 x squared. So the coefficient is just 240. Then if we look at x cubed, and I'll try and write it slightly neater this time, Again, the 6 stays identical because it's n. We've got these slightly thicker c. That's going to be position number 3. We have 2 to the power of n minus 3. n is 6, so we have 2 cubed times minus x cubed. And that's going to give us... So again, I'm not actually going to delete any of this. I'm actually going to go through and just edit it. So when you're doing the full binomial expansion, I would recommend just you know changing it rather than... Um, rewriting the whole thing. And that gives us minus 160 x cubed. So again, in this case, the coefficient is minus 160. And that there is three marks, which I think is pretty generous. Now it says hence. So if you remember what I've said in all of the other videos, whenever they use the word hence, it means you have to use part A. If you use part A, it make your life a thousand times easier. So let's find the coefficient of x cubed in the expansion, 3x plus 1, and bracket. Okay, so here's the tricky bit, okay? And there's something you have to remember. When we multiply, that, when we expand this thing out, 
the only x cubed terms are going to be when 3x minus 1 multiplies x cubed, so x squared, and when we have 3x minus 1 times x cubed. Because think about it, when we have 3x times x squared, we're going to get an x cubed term. Then we get minus x squared, so we can ignore that. Then we're going to get 3x times x cubed, which we ignore, but then we have minus x cubed. So what you need to remember here is that we are going to, we have to include both of these terms. If you notice, we already have the coefficients. So since we're only finding the coefficients, all we need to do is actually find them. So what we're going to do here is I want to re replace this with 3x minus 1 times the x squared term, which is 240x squared, which equals 3 times 240 is 720x squared, x cubed even. And then we have minus 240x squared. Now again, I don't actually care about this term. right? I care about this one here. Then we have 3x minus 1 multiplied by the x cubed term, which is minus 160 x cubed. 3 times that would give me 480, so it would be negative 480 x cubed, x to the 4 even, minus, so that would be actually plus 160 x cubed. Because again we have a minus times a minus. So we have these two parts here. So the overall coefficient of x cubed is going to be 720 plus 160, which is 880. Okay, because we're going to be gathering the like terms. So, the reason why this is important is because the only other way to do this, if you don't know this trick, is to actually do the full six-term expansion here, and then expand it by another bracket, which will get you the right answer, don't get me wrong, but it's going to take you five times longer. It's going to take you a hell of a long time. Um, and it's tedious and it's boring. The only terms that will give you x cubed are when you expand the x squared term and when you expand the x cubed term. So once you can kind of make that connection in your head, you can shorten this question down to the two marks it should be. Okay, the next thing is we need to be able to recognise arithmetic and geometric progressions. So first of all, we should talk about what the difference is between them. So arithmetic just means that you're adding the same value each time. So I say adding, but keep in mind, you could be adding a negative number. So actually, you're subtracting the same number each time. So for example, you might have 1, 3, 5, 7. As you can see, it's going up by 2. You could have 10, 6, 2. So as you can see, it's going down by 4. Okay. Geometric progressions have a common ratio. So this here is called a common difference. Here is called a common ratio. So what that means is you are timesing or multiplying, which also technically includes division, right? By same number each time. Okay? And you just need to be able to recognize them. So how can you recognize them? Because sometimes it can be a bit ambiguous. Well, the best thing to do is if you have a random progression, so let's say would be a good one to do. Um, one, four, and then eight, for example, going on. You can, like, for example, it could be times in by four each time, right? So the common ratio would be times in by four, because one to four is times and then times. So one way that I like to look at it is if you can't see a common difference, then it must be geometric. But the best way to tell is you just simply do 16 over four, and you do four over one. And if you notice, you're going to get the exact same value of 4. That means there's a common ratio. Because keep in mind that these aren't the only types of progressions that exist in the universe. right? There are also Fibonacci sequences, etc. So you need to be aware that if you want to prove that it's geometric or arithmetic, you need to actually work out the common difference or the common ratio. If there is no common difference and no common ratio, then it's neither an arithmetic sequence or a geometric sequence. Okay, so you need to keep that firmly in the back of your head as you do these questions. The next uh, part is, there's a ton of stuff here. Use the formula for the nth term uh, and for the sum of the first n terms to solve problems. So nth term, 
for let's let's split this whole thing in two. An arithmetic sequence is a plus m minus one d, where a is the first term. So in all of these, uh, this is going to be the first term. N is obviously what term number you're in. D is the difference. And I'm going to use a letter R later, which is the uh, common ratio, okay? For geometric, it's just A R to the N minus 1. So they both have that N minus 1 in them. For the sum, you're going to have for an arithmetic sequence over 2. D and for the geometric one this is going to come up a bit later but just for you to know now it's a to the r n minus 1 over r minus 1 okay so you need to be able to use those to solve problems and honestly uh, these actually become quite easy because there's a very limited number of things they can ask you and once you kind of practice them a little bit you're going to get a lot better at them you also need to use the idea of convergence of a geometric progression and the formula for the sum to infinity of a convergent geometric progression. So what, what, what is convergence? Well, convergence is that as you go along in a sequence, it eventually converges, so it gets closer and closer to a certain value. So what do I mean by this? Well, if r, the magnitude of it, is bigger than 1, then hopefully you can see that the terms will just keep getting bigger and bigger. So I'm going to generate a sequence here, right? So let's say 1 equals, and our answer, this is going to be whatever term I am. Let's say the um, value of r is 2, right? So we're doubling each time. If I keep doubling, right, can you see the number just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? And bigger? This means it's a divergent series, okay? Now let's take a different example. I'm going to take 10 as my first value, and I'm going to times it by let's say 0 0.9. So we get 9, then we get 8.1, then we get 7.29. Now let's keep going for a bit. So 4.3, 3.87, 3.48. 3 Can you see that the numbers are getting closer and closer together? All right. So the idea here is that this is a convergent series because it's getting closer and closer to a certain value. Okay. Now if, if a series is convergent, it means you can do a sum to infinity. So what is a sum to infinity? Well, an Sn is a sum of the first, let's say, 10 values, or 20 values, or 30 values. Now, if my series is going towards one certain value, then I should be able to add up an infinite number of terms and not get infinity, because it's going to eventually get, for example, let's say if the series is approaching 1, eventually I'm just going to be continuously adding 1, right? So then it's just going to converge to a point. Or if the um, series tends to zero, as I'm adding the numbers up and up and up again, it's approaching zero, which means I'm making less of a difference, okay? So you need to be able to use that. Now the sum to infinity, and again this only works if this isn't true. So you need to have your modulus of r is less than one, because it needs to be able to go to a certain value, normally zero. It's just a over one minus l nice and easy. Or alternatively, the difference here is that this bottom part should be positive. Okay, so just uh, keep that in mind. So if your value of r is different, you're subtracting one. Instead. Okay, so we have a bunch of uh, practice questions for this. So an arithmetic progression has first term seven. So I like to actually write down all of the information they give me. The nth term is 84 and the three nth term is is 245. So normally our nth term is this. What they're telling me is that when n equals n, right, we have 7 plus n minus 1. We don't know what d is. It's equal to 84. And then when n is equal to 3n, we have 7 plus 3n minus 1 d equals 245. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to subtract 7 from both sides for both of these guys, okay? So we have m minus 1 d equals 84 minus 7, which is 77. And then we have here 3n minus 1 d is 245. There are so many ways to solve this. You can use substitution. However, you can use a clever uh, use of elimination. 
I label these 1 and 2, if I divide the equations, d actually goes away. So we have m minus 1. And the reason why I haven't written the d is obviously we have d divided by d, which is just 1. So it disappears. Over 245. Now again, multiple ways to do this. I prefer to kind of cross multiply these out. So what I'm going to do is times through by 3n minus 1 and multiply through by 245 at the same time. So on the left hand side we're going to have 245 n minus 1 and on the right hand side we're going to have 77 3n minus 1. And then from here it's a linear equation you just need to expand and simplify. Um, I didn't actually do the subtraction there, that should be 238. Okay, so we have 238n minus 238 equals 77 times 3 is 231. So I'm going to bring the n's over to the left hand side and the numbers over to the right. So we have 7n, nice and easy, equals minus 77 plus 238 would be 161. So n is just going to equal 23. So again, not too bad, you just need to, and again, with these questions, they're always going to give you enough information to actually answer the question, right? So all you need to do is write out all of the information in terms of equations and in terms of just substitutions, like I did with A, and normally the solution just then presents itself, and it's quite, quite okay. Next, we have a question from the 2019 paper one. So we have the third and fourth terms of a geometric progression of 48 and 32, respectively, Find the sum to infinity of the progression. Okay, so if you remember, a here's what we need for the sum to infinity. So if we just quickly write that out, that's going to be a over one minus r. So the two things we need is we need a, which I don't know, and we need r, which I also don't know. So uh, how can we work it out? Well. We have two adjacent terms right here, okay? So, what if I take uh, the fourth term and divide it by the third, I'll get r. Because what that will give me is what I times the fourth term by in order to get, sorry, what I times the third times the third term by in order to get the fourth term. And that is the common ratio, it's the very definition of it. So all we're going to do is do 32 over 48, which if you divide it by uh, 16, you'd get two thirds. Nice and easy. Bear in mind that um, a lot of these questions can be calculator as well, so don't worry too much about that. But yeah. Okay, so now we need to work out what A is. We know what this is, that's good. We need to work out what A is. Well, again, using the same logic, n equals four gave us 32 n equals 3 was 48. So all I need to do is continue dividing by 2 thirds. Okay. And if you remember, uh, dividing by 2 thirds, that would be the same as times by 3 over 2. So you times it by 3 and then half it, and you just keep going from there. So that would be 72. And n equals 1 would be 108. Okay, so now we know both of those which means we can now just use our sum to infinity, all is well and good, is equal to 108 over 1 minus 2 thirds. So in other words, it is 108 over 1 third. So you're just doing 108 times 3, so that should be 324, right? Because 8 times 3 is 24, 100 times 3 is 300. Smush them together and you get your answer. Okay. Now here's where things get more fun. This is where they apply it into certain situations, which uh, I always find a bit more interesting. And this is where you can start picking up, I mean, in this case, five marks. And honestly, you don't need five marks for this. It's really not too bad. You don't need five minutes. 
So if we read through the context, two schemes are proposed for increasing the amount of household waste that is recycled each week. Scheme A increases it each month by 0 0.16 tonnes, and B is to increase it by 6% each month uh, of the amount recycled in the previous month. So if you notice, A is an arithmetic sequence because we're increasing by the same number every single month, and B is a geometric. Another way to kind of look at this is if you have a percentage increase every unit of time or every time you do something it's always geometric right it's just like doing compound interest back in GCSE okay because a percentage is always going to be it's going to be different every year right like a hundred increased by six percent is a hundred and six but increase that by six percent is going to go up by more than six uh, so hopefully that makes sense so if you have a percentage it's 99% of the time going to be geometric if you have a set amount it's obviously going to be arithmetic and all we need to do here is, so they're going to operate it for 24 months. The amount recycled in the first month is 2.5 tonnes. So for both of these guys, A is 2.4, oh, sorry, 2.5. And all we need to do is find the total amount of waste that would be recycled over the 24 month period. And this is the kind of calculation that people do in the real world, right? So before they put into place this scheme, right, they can work out how much in total over a certain period of time will each one do. So uh, just as a bit of context for this, short term, right, you can see the 0 0.16 is going to be bigger than 6% of 2.5, short term. But if you're doing it over a period of 24 months, it gets a bit closer. Long term, percentages always win. Compound interest, right, it always wins long term. But the question is, how long term are we talking? Is it 5 years, 10 years, 15 years? Who knows? So these kind of calculations, I mean, I'd be surprised if you can look at this and actually work out which one would be better just by looking at it. But um, yeah, so all we need to do is calculate it. So the sum for a arithmetic sequence, as we know, I'm just gonna write it again, because again, it is an equation you should try and remember. Is that? So if we're doing the sum of the first 24 months, we have 24 over two, 2 times 2.5 plus 24 minus 1 and D was increasing by, I didn't actually write that one down, 0 0.16 and that again that's why you should write these down all the time because I wasted a bit of time looking back through the question and confusing myself. So again keep in mind if you're in an exam if you don't see D when you've written it down you might not even check the answer again and it can cause pain. So we have 24 over 2. You can also work this out in your head and then sub it in. So 2 times 2.5, I could just put 5. But yeah, it's fine. I'm going to put it in fully just so you guys can see that I'm definitely doing things right. It also lets me see, like for example, if the answer didn't make sense to me, I can quickly see where I've gone wrong if I type the whole thing out. Whereas if I did 2 times 2.5 and I did something weird like wrote 4 or something, It'd be harder for me to pick up if I don't see the calculation like I do here. Like I can see 24 minus 1. Yeah, that looks correct. That's the same here. So that is 104.16 tons. We're going to keep it um, as accurate as humanly possible. And we're not going to forget the units because examiners are very tetchy about that. And the sum for the... So actually we should write out the ratio as well. 1.06. Remember, a 6% increase means you're going to add 6% onto 100%, which is 106%. Turn it into a ratio by dividing by 100, or decimal. And the sum for this is A, R to the power of N minus 1 over R minus 1. So if we sub those values in, A is 2.5. Then we have 1.06 to the power of 24 minus 1 over, God, 1.06 minus 1. Cool. So let's type this in. We have 2.5, 1.06 to the power of 24, minus 1, close brackets, over, you could put this in brackets, but honestly it doesn't matter. Um, but you do want to work it out first. 
zero photons, let's call it. So normally a part B, or like another part of the question would be, which one's better? But in this case, it just says, for each scheme, find the total. So I don't need to bother, which is nice. Uh, so that's a five marker. Again, I don't think that's too bad. I think that's pretty generous, considering we've just used effectively one equation for each one. And they gave us all the information. So we did two calculations for five marks. Pretty good. OK. Um, for June 2017, paper one, so an arithmetic progression has a first term of 32. So let's write that down. A fifth term of 22 and a last term of minus 28 find the sum of all the terms in the progression. So the last term thing is a bit more obscure, but um, there are a few things that we can do with that. So the fifth term, so remember we have a plus n minus, so I'm actually going to write n equals 5, just to make it super clear, plus 5 minus 1, and then whatever d is, should equal 22. So subtract 7, so we have 4d, and then subtract 32 would give me minus 10. So d is equal to minus 2.5. Cool. And then the last term of minus 28. So if you remember rightly, when we want to work out the sum of all of the terms, I need to know how many terms there are. So we need to actually work out what the last term thing means. You might be wondering also how there can be a last term. So keep in mind, series can end whenever you want, right? So the person who made this progression just ended it because they wanted to. Um, so let's just keep in mind, it doesn't actually reach an end. Arithmetic progressions can go on forever, right? Like if I'm adding one each time, I can go on forever, right? I can go on an infinite amount of time. Now, I'm going to write n equals question mark because the last term, I don't know what number that is. So we have 32 plus m minus 1 times minus 2.5 equals minus 28. So minus 32 from both sides and expand the brackets. We have minus 2.5n plus 2.5 equals um, minus 60. Yep. Yeah. Cool. I don't know why that was so difficult for me. And n equals minus 62.5. So just use that last bit. We have n is equal to 25, it would be. So now we can actually do our sum here. 25 over 2, 2 times a, which is 32, plus 25 minus 1 times minus 2.5. Again, this is where brackets come in handy because you, you actually remember to multiply by the minus number instead of accidentally adding it or subtracting it in this case, which, believe me, happens a lot more than you might think. 25 over 2 multiplied by 2 times 32 plus 25 minus 1 minus 2.5 50. That was kind of anticlimactic, wasn't it? But yeah, it's just 50. <laughs> okay, and again, that's a four mark question. I don't think that's particularly bad. Um, but yeah, that should be pretty good. And then for part B, now we actually have a little bit of a situation. So each year a school allocates a sum of money for the library. The amount allocated each year increased by 2.5% of the amount allocated in the previous year. Again, this is just compound interest. So this is definitely geometric. And the increase is what? 1.025. In 2005, the school allocated $2,000. So A is equal to two grand. Find the total amount allocated in the years 2005, 2014 inclusive. This is actually a part where a lot of A-level students make a mistake, which is um, it's kind of funny, but also it makes complete sense. Finding the difference between years, and especially if they don't say inclusive. If they don't say inclusive, then it's not too bad. So if this wasn't inclusive, the, the way to work out how many years that is, you do 2014 minus 2005, right? And that's nine years. But when it's inclusive, you're including 2005 and 2014. So 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's 10 years. So, so many times, students have actually made this mistake in finding the years. And to be honest, I don't blame them. It can be a bit tricky with the language. But remember, if you're counting something and including the numbers, you need to add one to whatever you'd normally count, right? So normally, I'd count 
2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, blah, 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 which would only give me nine. So be careful with that. They also like to do it with like birthdays. So someone might receive a sum of money on their birthday and increases by a percentage. Um, this starts when they're 10, ends when they're 20. How many years has it been? Well, you have to include 10 and 20. So it's not 10 years, it's 11 years. So N is 11, not 10, which again, it's really easy to lose track of. If you're ever stuck, you know, be, be humble and just literally write out the years as a fire, and then count the number of years you have. Because again, with birthdays and stuff, people get that wrong all the time um, and it's not really necessary. So in this case, we're actually working out N equals 10, not nine. The other way to think of it is you find the difference and add one, right? Up to you and which one you want to do. So again, S of 10, we have, uh, just to so remember, it's A, R to the N minus one over R minus one. So if we write this out again, we have 2000 and R is 1.025 to the power of 10, subtract one over 1.025 minus one. And let's do this. Two, one, two, three. Open bracket 1.025 to the power of 10 minus 1, close bracket, over 1.025 minus 1. And keep in mind, it's money, so only go to two decimal places. If you go to less than that, or more than that, they can deduct you a mark. And that's my perfect dollar sign. We have $22,406 and 76 cents, which brings us to the end. And that's all you really need to know for series in terms of paper one. Um, and again, if you notice, we use the same equations over and over and over again. You just need to be able to recognize the equations, use the basic kind of nth term and summation uh, equations, and then obviously the sum to infinity, assuming it's a convergent series. And that's all you really need to know for this. So I'll see you in the next one.